Afternoon class, afternoon. Settle down at the back. Who's that boy with a cleft IQ? Thompson, stop it. Leave Glamini alone. Uh, what do you think this is? 1982, for goodness sake. Welcome to Go Open. This week we go back to school, not for nostalgia's sake, but to look at how today's learners are being set free with open source. Here we go. Open source software exists as a result of the combined efforts of millions of computer programmers, users, and software vendors from around the world. They share their intellectual property freely, and they believe that software should cost nothing and should enrich the lives of users. Open source software is the alternative and biggest challenger to closed source or proprietary software. It generally costs the user nothing. It can be distributed freely to anyone. Download it, use it, modify it, and give it away. It's a whole new world. Open source is the future of computing. Later on, we'll be taking a break to play with our noodle. That's right, we can all play with each other's noodles. It'll be a noodle fest. We'll be getting the skinny on thin clients. Okay, good. Let's move on. Uh, kids must leave school computer literate these days, and to help them do that, there is open source. For anyone leaving school, computer literacy is not negotiable. A school without a computer lab is simply not equipping its learners for life in our modern computerized environment. Yet by its very nature, a computer lab is expensive to set up and maintain, especially if you want to run the latest software. We were looking to upgrade and uh, it would have cost us in the region of about 70,000 Rand to upgrade our lab here. Well, what we needed to do was to put on um, Encarta 2002 and go up to Windows 2000. And the problem was they, they needed more RAM and they ne needed bigger hard drives. Keith Bosenberg is the computer teacher at Hurdeskir Primary School in Cape Town. Although they're an elite private school, funding for the upgrade was a problem. Then he heard about the Tux Labs project. I went along, had a look, and they explained to me that you didn't need hard drives. You didn't need P4s. We've got P1s. Um, and for almost next to nothing, we could upgrade. We didn't you know, need to go up to the next operating system of Windows and so on. The school refitted their computer lab for a mere 20,000 Rand. All the existing computers were converted to thin clients running Linux with a powerful server handling the data. The package includes office suites and educational software, while the need for an encyclopedia is met by the internet. We use Wikipedia, and Wikipedia is a web-based program, and what's nice about it is that it's interactive, and it's in Afrikaans as well, which is very big because our school is English Afrikaans as well. At Hyde Park High, librarian Jeanette Long had a steep learning curve when she volunteered to upgrade the school's computer lab. And then when the person who was running the computers left, I said, well, I'd take it over. Little knowing what I was letting myself in for, I started from scratch. I started doing an A-plus course and got thrown into fixing the computers. Jeanette grew her school's complement of 30 PCs to 140 in three different computer labs, mainly by using thin client technologies to keep costs down. So the advantage for us is we can migrate old machines. We don't have to throw them away. It's less of a security risk in the classroom because the, the thin client machine has little value to a thief. And our terminal server itself is not huge either. It's a P3 600 megahertz, I think. The thin client philosophy has also been adopted by Direct Learn, a company that has been providing services as far afield as Namibia and Nigeria. NGOs like Schoolnet coordinate with their governments to implement IT in schools. Direct Learn offer assistance with the implementation. We use a number of different technologies. Open Lab is the core driving product that we use uh, in terms of our work in Africa. Uh, open Lab being a philosophy whereby, number one, it's about computer lab environments, so it's multiple computers in one place. And secondly, the fact that it's based on, on the open source philosophy. Open Lab is a free and open source distribution based on Slackware Linux, packaged with a host of educational software and country-specific syllabus material. They have created a centralized management tool that makes it easy for a teacher to administer the system, and it's also been optimized to handle streaming multimedia. In 2001, when we started our development, we knew right from the start that we would want to work throughout Africa. And our first opportunities really actually arose in West Africa, Nigeria, where um, our partners there, uh, Schoolnet Nigeria, suddenly said, well, in order for us to address this, uh, an education uh, system with over 50,000 schools, 130 million people, 
and the uptake being almost at zero initially, we're needing to do it with a different way. We're needing to take a different philosophy, and we like what you guys are doing. The first stage of 35 schools has been completed, and the project aims to expand to 2,000 schools in the next three years. Before now, people were talking about the fact that you know, deploying technology in schools will be too expensive and you won't be able to support it and the schools, you know. But like we've been able to prove that that's, it's workable and um, we're now expanding to many more sites. In Namibia, progress has been even greater thanks in part to nationwide wireless internet access provided by Telecom Namibia. Our 300 plus clients collectively give somewhere between 180 and 250,000 learners and teachers access to the internet on a daily basis. That is huge, it's massive. We have a very conservative, very heavily subsidized deal for providing internet solutions and access to resources over the internet through this relationship we founded with Telecom Namibia. And I mean, that for me is still the most important issue for school net organizations all over Africa is to deliver access to the internet at affordable levels. And in terms of government spend, in terms of public spend, in terms of I as a parent at my school who has to pay school fees and ultimately that's what's going to buy the computers for the school, I don't want to have to pay 500,000 Rand for a computer lab when I can pay 100,000 Rand. I'd rather spend that extra 400,000 on getting another good bunch of teachers or getting more computer labs or playing with other technologies such as broadcast or whatever they may be. We can't just say let's make it cheaper, computers cheaper, software for free, etc, etc. We've got to say Maybe if I look at it more laterally, there are other better ways of doing things. They will see the groundswell, the massification starting to take place, where we have great technology being used by great teachers in our schools. And then we start to see things change in this country. Great minds don't always think alike. Like, for example, me and the Teletubbies, we just don't get on, I don't know what it is. Anyhow, in the open and free software world, this is particularly true. Um, Richard Stallman, for example, is one of the great rene renegades of this movement. He has some pretty radical ideas. He believes that um, all software should just be free, um, like Bo Peep's sheep. He also has some radical thoughts on free software in the developing world. Right, Richard, firstly, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us. In South Africa, we have quite a big problem with regards to software piracy. I really don't think so. Piracy is attacking ships, and I don't think that they do it with software. Sharing copies of software is everybody's natural right, and nobody should ever take that away. We uh, form part of the continent of Africa, a developing world. How do you see the free software movement assisting in uh, the improvement of, of the continent? Freedom is just as important for people in poor countries as for people in rich countries. However, there's a secondary benefit for, which is especially important in poor countries, which is because you are free to redistribute it, you can, if you like, make lots of copies and spread them around. You can set up a distribution tree. The developers of proprietary software are charging monopoly rents, each and every one of them. In Africa, most people who can get a computer can't possibly afford those fees. And so every school in Africa, when it gets a computer, should insist on using free software because these schools should not be teaching people to be helplessly dependent on proprietary software. Bill Gates once said, the unauthorized copies of Windows would act to get users addicted and eventually Microsoft would find a way to charge them. So schools should not provide Windows or any other non-free software to the students any more than they'd provide free packs of cigarettes to the students. How do you see the next two to three years with regards to the free software movement? The use of free software is spreading, it's catching on in more places. But at the same time, I see that most of the people who are talking about it, using it, and encouraging other people to use it, do not talk about freedom as the reason why. But people who've come to recognize that free software means you have freedom, that using free software means you're cooperating with your community, that you're ready to help your neighbors if they want your help. These people are going to resist very hard if anybody makes them use non-free software. So those are the people who will really fight for freedom. 
What, what, what final message would you like to send to viewers which will be watching this program here? I'm happy that I took the campaign for human rights into the area of computer use, into the area of how we use software. But the broader fight for human rights and civil liberties is still going on. We need your help. Next up, a great story about a business that saved thousands by using Linux to run Windows on a thin client network. I know it all sounds very confusing, but if you think about it, it's actually buyer buyer slum. Open source is open for business, and Linux, the flagship of the open source operating systems, is very happy to peacefully coexist with other operating systems. It's like a big friendly neighborhood. And speaking of which, let's visit Pipeline Technology. When it comes to computing, thinner can sometimes be better. When a large number of computers are being used for everyday use, the thin client model can prove to be very cost effective. One powerful server can supply enough horsepower needed for a computer lab, an internet cafe, or even an office. And with fewer moving parts, there's less to go wrong. Pipeline performance technologies do testing and analyses for water, gas, and oil pipelines. It's a job that requires specialized gathering of data in the field, which is then processed on proprietary Windows computers. But when they needed to upgrade their software, they found their existing hardware was too old and needed upgrading. They spoke to Linux Business Solutions Providers 7C. When they mentioned to us that they needed to upgrade their entire IT network, we carried out a cost comparison between Windows software running on the workstations versus a Linux-based thin client solution running on the workstations. Paul suggested that instead of throwing out the old PCs, to convert them into thin clients and install a powerful server to handle the software. When the workstation boots up, Linux actually boots up. And the moment the person logs in to the workstation, um, a, a, um, a connection is established with the Windows 2000 server and the applications actually run on the Windows 2000 terminal server, but the display of these applications gets rendered to the Linux thin client on the workstation. So although it appears as if they have Windows software running on the workstation, in fact they are not. One of the reasons why we still have Windows though is that we have some proprietary software for certain of our, of our instruments which run in that environment. And also because we do a fair amount of work overseas, uh, we, we receive a lot of documentation and information using proprietary software. For businesses, there are many good reasons to use open source. For pipeline performance technologies, the most compelling reason was price. And how much have we actually saved by setting up the Linux thin client server? It cost us 30% of what the price would have been if we had gone for standalone desktops. Could you give us a ballpark estimate? In our case, it was 100,000 Rand and the thin client solution ended up costing us 30,000 Rand. So a saving of 70,000, which is very really significant for a small company like ours. The Battle of Britain may have been won on the playing fields of Eton, bloody stupid place to fight a war, but the Battle of Software is being fought and won on very different playing fields. Take our next guest. This guy's really remarkable South African, Charles Majola. He was educated locally and then taught himself how to program and then produced a piece of software that's being used all around the country, uh, and I think that's amazing. Thanks for coming, Charles. Great to have you here. Thank you. Basically, you kind of just, through curiosity, and kind of, you just went and became this programmer who just wrote something that everyone's using. Yes. For that, I had to learn quite a lot. So um, at the time, we didn't have computers um, from our township school. So what happened is there was this uh, resource center there, which we found that we can go there to access computers and uh, to use the internet. What happened is I used to download uh, open source programs, um, especially the ones I was interested in to see how they work and how they were written so they work the way they do. Then from then I could learn quite a lot about software engineering um, in general. Charles, you, you've been recognized from you know, being kind of you know, teaching yourself how to program to um, helping to create quite a significant program that's been recognized all over the country. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I found a job at this one company where they um, work with accounting software. They actually produce accounting software, which is open source. Um, within three months, they, I was working on the core of the system. Um, it was quite a challenge at first. And 
I got recognized by CSIR for the work I did, and that's when um, Mark Shuttleworth actually found out about me, and then he thought, well, it would be a good idea to have me on the team. I work there as a developer. We develop Ubuntu, which means we get different software applications to work with Ubuntu, and then we try to do bug fixing um, from the users who use Ubuntu when they find that there's bugs or problems with the software. So what's the ultimate thing you think you could do you know, with programming? Um, I can write uh, quite sophisticated software from security to firewalls to um, SMS handlers like SMS services. Right now I can work on actually packaging software for a specific operating system which is uh, distributed by a, maybe a specific company like Ubuntu Linux, which I'm working on now. Thanks for joining us. All the best with Ubuntu. We hope it goes well, and uh, hopefully we'll see you in lights in the future. Thank Cheers, you. Charles. Thank you very much. Coming up in a moment, it will be break time as we have fun with our computers, lunch boxes, and small things on the jungle gym. It'll be lovely. Often, people who are looking at open source are concerned about support. How do I get help? Where's a support desk? What's the best bra for me? Well, there are a few ways, and here to tell us about that is Mark Shuttleworth. So what do you do when things go wrong? Open source isn't produced by a company, so it's not immediately obvious where you would go to get technical support. And what we're going to show you today is how the open source community, which is the thousands and thousands of people who write open source software, participate in helping the people who use the software. Your first port of call should be the website of the hardware or software you need help with. If it's a more general query, there are a few sites like linushelp.net, linuxforum.com, and justlinux.com, who provide free forums run by volunteers. Remember, the more details you provide, the more your online guru can help you. A great place to start for support and help on any of the software that we feature in this show is the Go Open Source website. Check it out today at www.goopensource.org. If you have any questions about anything you've seen or heard in this program, in fact, anything even about this space here, you can find us to ask us questions at um, Mr. Go Open at worldwideweb.goopensource.org. And uh, we'll tell you as much as we can. Also, there you can find details of how you two can own all 312 glorious, cinematic, genius moments of the open source program for the bargain price of 199 Rand. It's all quite worthwhile, we think. Uh, and apart from that, we thought it was time to have some fun now. So we'd like it very much if you'd come along with us while we play with our noodle. In the pot today is Noodle, and I'm talking to two of the key developers, Ross Addis and Bongani Chlope. Ross, let's start with you. What is Noodle Linux? Well, we decided to create Noodle Linux because businesses are climbing on board with, uh, with Linux distributions, and it's becoming very business-orientated and boring. So we wanted to go to something that's very funky, off the wall, something that, that home users can enjoy, find humorous, find fun. Morgana, you code for Noodle Linux. Now, what have you added to make it special and different? I work on the kernel stuff, which is backend, so you won't see any pretty pictures that I do. What does one do if they already have a proprietary system on their PC? You can repartition your drive and use some free space there. Uh, just play with Noodle, and everything should work perfectly for you. When you guys were first developing it, what did you learn from other distros that made you want to, to change to a graphical interface? Our very first distro, MP Linux One, um, was based on Debian. And we decided to make something completely uniquely South African. Uh, so we went with MP, and the base of Noodle Linux is in fact MP Linux Two. We've taken out a lot of the boring stuff, um, like the server stuff, and then we've put in far more games, um, educational utilities for kids, uh, stuff which every home user will need and want and we need a lot of feedback from users of what they want in the distro, how can we make it more fun, how can we make it more appealing. Um, in order to do this we have a, a weekly cartoon on our website so people have some incentive to visit our website uh, every week and look at our updates and have a look at the cartoon which is sometimes a bit uh, funky and off the wall. So we've got the stove on, we've thrown our noodles in, let's get cooking. Well, hey, it's time to go web crawling with Ruth Spielware. And today, she's looking at open source education sites. It's going to be huge. Woohoo! 
The Linux documentation project at www.tldp.org has been running for a number of years. Everything on the site has been built by the online community of users. You can find how-tos for a whole range of topics from setting up a generic Linux install to configuring advanced firewall settings. Users can contribute tutorials and how-tos to increase the available knowledge base. From one community to another, IndieMedia.org was started as an outlet for independent news media. IndieMedia rejects any external forces which may influence the way their media is portrayed. They publish news articles from all over the world, focusing frequently on the news that doesn't make it to bigger news sources. Check out the localized news sources, especially the area dedicated to South African news. Now, if you're the type of person who likes to know how your opinions compare to other people, then click on to quizfarm.com. Quizfarm allows you to take any of a host of user-posted quizzes. You get to see how other users feel on specific topics. And you're free to create and upload quizzes of your own. Now, I wonder what people would think of posting a quiz about this show? Well, here's the buzz. The Linux documentation project at tldp.org is the place for you to go if you want comprehensive help about your Linux platform. IndieMedia.org is your source of independent news and views where you can find out what's really going on. And QuizFarm.com is the right place to go if you A, like quizzes, B, have an opinion, or C, all of the above. Well, that's all we have time for. Thanks for joining us once again. I'm just kidding. It's time for the competition. This week, we have wonderful things to give away once again. We have some DVD writers, a flat screen PC monitor from LG. There are two 1,000 Rand gift vouchers. Those are from Soviet clothing. And of course, that excellent HP photo smart camera and printer bundle. Here's the question. Is Noodle A an instant computer, B a very clever computer, or C a South African fun and entertainment Linux distribution? SMS your answer, A, B, or C uh, will do, plus your name to 34357. You'll be charged two rand per SMS. Ha! Who's the winner? Who's the winner? Who's the week's winner? Who's the winner? Penny Hewist is the proud owner of the 17-inch LG monitor. John Smith and Stephen White each win an LG DVD writer. Ridwan Kava and Debbie Erasmus will look very stylish in their Soviet jeans. And Karen Bertha is the proud owner of the HP camera and printer bundle. Congratulations. Well, this has certainly been an education for me. I don't know about you, but that's all we have time for. I don't know where the time goes. I really don't. Uh, maybe we left it open, so it went. That's why it's called Go Oprah. I don't know. Next week, no Oprah, Go Open. That's what's happening. It's very exciting. We travel to China, which is basically Lebanese for China. We look at programs and operating systems that are being translated into South African languages as well. And we play backgammon with a new angle. Ah, uh, yes, stick around, you'll see what that means. Okay, kids, there's the bell. It's home time. Bye bye. Oh, 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 oh.